Thank you, Lisa. Good morning. The uh, title for my talk today is Against the World for the World, and the subtitle is The Church as Culture and the Church in Culture. And the text uh, I'd like to use is from James 1.27, where James writes, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, the title for this talk, Against the World, For the World, is not an original title. In 1975, there was a group of 18 scholars and clergy who gathered in Hartford, Connecticut to discuss various ways in which American Christianity had become captive to the spirit of the age. And they presented a series of papers later published in a book called Against the World, For the World. They also published a manifesto which was called the Hartford Appeal. If you're interested in this, you can find that online. In the words of the appeal, quote, the renewal of Christian witness and mission requires constant examination of the assumptions shaping the church's life. Today, an apparent loss of a sense of the transcendent is undermining the church's ability to address with clarity and courage the urgent tasks to which God calls it in the world. This loss is manifest in a number of pervasive themes. Many of these are superficially attractive, but on closer examination we find these themes false and debilitating to the church's life and work." Close quote. And in the final document that was produced by this gathering, they identified 13 themes. They summarized them in short sentences and then repudiated these themes in short paragraphs. Some of them had to do, for instance, with the nature of salvation. For example, they said that it's commonly assumed that to realize one's potential and to be true to oneself is the whole meaning of salvation. This was an idea that was actually uh, present among theologians, uh, not just something that was present uh, in, uh, on Oprah. Uh, another one, the struggle for a better humanity will bring about the kingdom of God. And here they had in mind principally uh, the work of, of some liberation theologians. Now, one of the signers of this uh, document was the theologian named Stanley Hauerwas, who was then teaching at Notre Dame. He's now at the Duke Divinity School. Hauerwas is a very interesting theologian, a kind of uh, feisty uh, and uh, controversial man. And in 1995, he wrote an article very much in the spirit of this Hartford appeal called Preaching as Though We Had Enemies. In the essay, he said, one hopes that God is using this time to remind the church that Christianity is unintelligible without enemies. The whole point, indeed, the whole point of Christianity is to produce the right kind of enemies. Now, there are places in the world today where Christians understand that the message of the gospel does produce enemies. There are places where martyrdom is as familiar to believers as it was at the height of the persecution of, the, of Christians by the Roman Empire. But some Christians are reluctant to admit that they should have enemies. After all, Christians have to love their enemies, and actually having enemies would require loving someone who might be really nasty to you. It's a lot easier to behave in a way that avoids making enemies no matter what compromises you have to make, just so long as you don't actually have to love someone who's out to do you in, in some way or another. We would all rather be loved than love an enemy. But Jesus calls us to love God more than love being loved. And loving God will, in a twisted world, produce enemies. Loving justice more than profit might produce enemies. Loving truth more than power might produce enemies. Loving the law of love itself more than loving the principle of self-indulgence may produce enemies. On the night in which he was betrayed to his enemies by his friend, Jesus prayed for his disciples and for those who would believe on account of the testimony of the disciples. In other words, he was praying for the whole church, including us, 
can read this prayer in John 17. He's only hours away from the cross, and yet the focus of the prayer is on the well-being of his disciples whose lives are about to get a lot more challenging within a few hours. And early in the prayer, Jesus says to God the Father, I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. And later in the prayer, he says this, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Now let's look at a little bit what Jesus says about the relationship between his disciples and what he calls the world. And the world is a key theme in this text that we're using today uh, from the epistle of James. What does he mean by the world? He clearly can't mean the physical world because both he and his disciples were of the world in that way. Uh, They they lived on the earth. They were born in the earth. Uh, They had human identity. And nor does he just mean social order outside the Christian community, life outside the church. The term the world is often used by Christians to mean all those institutions that aren't explicitly Christian. Well, Jesus had fishermen and tax collectors among his disciples. These were people very much engaged in non-religious life. Uh, So I don't think that's what he means when he says his disciples are hated by the world because they're not of the world. And I think what he means is a third definition of the word that's used there, the Greek word cosmos, from which we get both the word cosmic and the word cosmetic. Uh, I won't explain how we get both of those. (laughs) I think what he means is a human order of life apart from God. All of those systems and structures of social and cultural life and the ideas embedded in those structures that ignored or rejected God. The Greek word cosmos translated in John 17 as world has these three senses in scripture. It can sometimes mean the whole created order or the whole earth as I think it means Uh, in John 3.16, where it says, God so loved the world. Or it can mean the human community. It can mean all human beings. Or it can mean what I think it means in this prayer, what it means in 1 John 2, when John writes, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And I think it's the same meaning that we have in this text today in James. It's this third meaning that we find a clue to the necessity of the church being a, a countercultural community and thus making the right kinds of enemies. This third basic sense of cosmos, of world, refers to what sociologist Craig Gay describes as, quote, an interpretation of reality that essentially excludes the reality of God from the business of life. In Craig Gay's understanding, and I think in the Scripture's understanding, anyone who assumes that we can understand what the business of life is about without referring to God and His order and rule is behaving in a worldly way. Theologian David Wells similarly argues that worldliness in this third sense refers to fallen humanity en masse, fallen humanity the collective expression of every society's refusal to bow before God, to receive his truth, to obey his commandments, or to believe in his Christ. Wells goes on further that the world is what fallen humanity uses as a substitute for God and his church. The world in this sense encompasses the intellectual horizons of the falling, that is what they assume about reality, so it's a, it's a mental thing, it's an intellectual thing. It, it encompasses also their appetites, their desires, what they want to do with their lives, the way they order their life, their priorities, their behavior, what they really want and what they will do to get it. It encompasses social arrangements, the public context in which fallen life is lived out. The world is the sole preoccupation of those who are fallen those one-dimensional earth dwellers for whom there are no considerations in life more important than eating, drinking, possessing, and being merry. 
This world is fading, but that is no impediment to those who seek their fulfillment in it rather than in God. So it is, as Flannery O'Connor observed, that if you are a Christian, you have to cherish the world at the same time that you struggle to endure it. And again, I would say here, cherish the first two senses of the cosmos. Cherish the world as creation. Cherish the world as all of humanity, but endure that third sense in which humanity, in a sense, delights in its fallenness. Another biblical passage where the word cosmos is used is this, in this third negative sense is this text I'm using today from the letter of James. It's at the end of the first chapter of the book, and James offers this remarkable summary statement, a single sentence in which he summarizes the whole of Christian obedience. This is kind of breathtaking. One sentence to describe what true religion consists of, and it's actually only two things. It's a short list, very short list. There is in this brief recognition, an echo of Jesus' powerful compression of the whole of the law into two phases, of loving God totally and loving our neighbors. And James similarly offers a two-phase summary. Visit orphans and widows in their distress. Keep oneself unstained by the world. With an artful brevity, James restates the two commands that Jesus affirmed as a summary of obedience, the requiring of loving God and loving neighbor. The order here is reversed, and this broad responsibility to loving our neighbors is summarized by the concrete and representative responsibility of caring for orphans and widows. And who are orphans and widows? Well, they're people whose lives are broken and painful because of some disorder, a specific disorder that expresses the general disorder by which sin ravages our lives. And the duty to love God with all of our being is rephrased in negative terms as the duty to avoid worldliness. And again, this echoes what the Apostle John warns us in 1 John 2, that worldliness is incompatible with having the love of the Father in us. I describe this as an artful brevity because there's a kind of tension in this summary of true religion. The caring for orphans and widows suggests an attentiveness to the messy reality of people's lives. It's an obligation that shows us the kind of religion announced in the gospel. It's a religion that calls us into the world, not out of the world. Because the gospel as is, after all, not a private and wholly interiorized message. But it's the good news of the kingdom of God. It's the rule of God over a redeemed people who are called to love and serve their king throughout all of creation, not just in the austere privacy of their own hearts. But having reminded us of our call out into the world, James immediately warns of the dangers of worldliness. These two phases, the love of the world, as in 1 John 3.16, and the refusal to love the world, as in 1 John 2, 15, are the organizing principles of true religion. These two phases, the love of the world and the refusal to love the world, are what identify us as true believers. The good news of the kingdom calls us away from worldliness, that is, away from an understanding of reality that ignores God and thus promotes disordered living, But simultaneously, it propels us into the ongoing life of human society within God's creation, where we're charged to imitate Christ's love to us. As Paul declares, without love, we're nothing. We gain nothing. John writes in his first letter, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. And of course, that walk, that sacrificial, that self-giving walk, wasn't just a sequence of uplifting religious meetings. It wasn't Uh, just a a time of of sharing that we enjoy privately, but it was a life of service with the needy, with the bereaved, with the suffering, with outcasts, orphans and widows. And that way of life should characterize what I call the culture of the church, the way of life of the church. So our faith is neither worldly nor otherworldly. The Bible repeatedly warns us about worldliness living as if God wasn't God, as if we were the lords of creation, 
But the Bible doesn't encourage us to despise creation or to reject human society or to avoid cultural pursuits. We're not saved out of our humanity, rather we're saved into our true humanity. Because our Savior is also our creator and our brother. Because Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father, still bearing our humanity, there's no sphere of human experience in which Christian faith is irrelevant. In the order that God established in creation, there were to be no orphans and widows. Their distress, which we're obliged to attend to, is a product of the disorder introduced by sin. But precisely because that original order established by God still matters to God, precisely because as the incarnation and the resurrection instruct us, creation is not a lost cause, we're required to minister to the victims of disorder and to try to restore some sense of order in their lives. And the church, as the renewed people of God, is called, first of all, to recognize the disorders in the world, to name them as such, and to strive to display before the world in its own cultural life the order that's implicit within God's creation. There's this, there is a kind of paradox between on one, uh, at one and the same time being called into the world and yet uh, enjoined to avoid worldliness. And yet there's an intimate relationship between the presence of orphans and widows and worldliness. Worldliness, after all, is understood as a way of understanding creation on our own terms, as if we were God. Then it becomes obvious if we live that way, there's going to be a lot of disorder in human society. There are going to be a lot of people with uh, significant disorders in their personal lives. In contemporary culture, uh, when we, uh, if we assume that creation, including the shape of human life, doesn't have any intrinsic meaning or order established by God, which is in contemporary culture increasingly the common assumption, there's no meaning inherent in the nature of things. We make up meaning, and we make up meaning to suit our own pleasure, our own desires. Uh, when we assume that, uh, if we assume that we're free to order life any way we want to, then there are bound to be orphans and widows, not just literal orphans and widows, but what I think of as metaphorical orphans and widows, people whose lives are cut off from some natural good that should be theirs if they were participating in creation properly. So if, for example, a society accepts the idea that marriage and the family and parental responsibility and authority and the boundaries of sexuality are all simply things we make up as we go along, what the sociologists call social constructions. This is just our invention and we're free to change it as we see fit. If a society believes that, then there are inevitably going to be people whose lives suffer the abrasions that come when we go against the grain of the universe. If we insist on understanding the structure of creation in our own terms rather than on God's terms, which, as I'm saying, is the essence of worldliness, then there are going to be many broken lives. There are going to be people who fail to acknowledge their brokenness, and that's what makes it trickiest. That's one of the reasons why we make enemies, because we want to uh, affirm people's brokenness, and they want to affirm the fact that they're quite whole. Transvestites who insist that their way of life is sexually fulfilling. Artists who insist that beauty is purely subjective. Spouses who believe sincerely that their infidelities will strengthen their marriage. Novelists whose destructive stories are claimed to be a fulfillment of human liberty. These and countless others are metaphoric orphans and widows. But they're discouraged they are prevented by the spirit of the age from even acknowledging their distress. And in both phases of this admonition, Jesus, uh, James calls us to action in recognizing and resisting the institutionalization of rebellion. The institutionalization of rebellion. Not just living the way we want to, but the fact that living the way we want to has been formally sanctioned by our institutions. Philip Reif, a wonderful, uh, brilliant sociologist and uh, social theorist, once observed that the whole point of cultural institutions historically is to establish boundaries and to teach us 
uh, principles of right and wrong to instill in our conscience uh, principles of what we ought not to do and what we ought to do. But modern culture is guided by, and, and modern cultural institutions are guided by the sense that their principal task is to encourage people to fulfill whatever desires they have, to pursue their own self-fulfillment on their terms, which is why Philip Reeve says we're living in an anti-culture, a time when the institutions formerly regarded as restraining institutions now see their task as liberating institutions. And that's what I mean by the institutionalization of rebellion. And this is one of the reasons, living in a culture that has institutionalized rebellion, we're bound to make enemies. We shouldn't be surprised at it. The message of James serves as a great challenge to those who believe that Christianity is a purely inward affair and that the gospel is about personal salvation and piety, period, has nothing to do with how we live and work, buy and sell, eat and drink, make laws or write books. Christianity is in this view a recipe for happiness and eternal life, but it has very little to do with the shape of this life, with the exception of establishing a few moral boundaries. I'm afraid this is quite common and quite tragic. It is a form of having faith without works. To separate Christian conviction from social and cultural life may appear to be quite pious, but it is, in fact, I would argue, a form of worldliness. It's a way of us understanding Christian religion on the world's terms, which wants us to keep our faith private. Writer I read recently said it's ironic that many Christians practice a faith that the ACLU would love. They believe in private spirituality with no public consequences. How nice for the ACLU. But this view doesn't fit the Christian assumption. There's a tacit affirmation in this view of an assumption that's at the root of modern secularism. That religion is really about private, spiritual, subjective things. But the, the real world, the world of space and time, the world of social life, the objective world is one in which science and economics rule and it has essentially nothing to do with God. According to the message of the kingdom of God, however, our Lord is the maker and the sustainer and the king over all and there is no corner of the universe concerning which he's indifferent, no aspect of our lives whose meaning isn't derived from his creative wor word. Many people think that religion should be kept on a short leash. People who are content to receive the gospel as a kind of therapeutic salve to soothe all of the abrasions caused by the friction of life after the fall. Who want preaching and teaching to be little more than a pep talk. Motivational insights for living that will get them through the next week. And far too, Ameri too many American Christians are invested in the social and cultural status quo that's deeply compromised by what the New Testament calls worldliness. They're willing to honor Jesus in their hearts, but reluctant of the consequences of his claims in the ways that they make money or play or shop or vote or eat and drink. And so James helps us see that there finally is no paradox between loving the world, as in John 3.16, that is loving the creation that God has made, and not loving the world, as in 1 John 2.15, not loving the human tendency to set up our own desires as God. Now in the rest of his letter, and I'd encourage you to read James sometime in the next couple of days, James helps us see a number of other things as well that will guide us in this task of uh, not being stained by the world and caring for uh, those who are needy uh, in our midst. James reads more like wisdom literature than law. It's more like uh, Proverbs than Galatians or Romans. Uh, and uh, James helps us see a number of things, the kinds of commitments we need if we're both to love the world and not love the world. In order to fulfill the requirements of true religion as James presents it to us, we have to have knowledge of the word of truth that has saved us because the knowledge of the truth is the platform from which our love of neighbors is launched. And we're free to love because we know that Christ has first loved us. We have to have endurance, another theme in James's letters, endurance that's forged in the testing of our faith because the enemies that we make in our struggle with worldliness are numerous and crafty and persistent. And finally, we have to have self-control and wisdom. Self-control because the demands of love 
require a sustained deliberateness and concentration, and wisdom because a gift of discernment to assess the categories of need of which widows and orphans are just a small fraction. And in order to recognize the webs of worldliness that disorder our lives and those of our neighbors and which distract us from the good and simple gifts that God has given us in creation. The church is in desperate need of making the right kinds of enemies and of the virtues outlined in the epistle of James that will enable us to love those who are in need while we avoid the, world, uh, the world's way of understanding its own need. And the world is in desperate need of a church that's equipped that way. Thank you.